Welcome back, boxing fans. Combat Talk Radio, found at combattalk.fm. That's our new site address. Might write it down, note it down. Combattalk.fm. That's our new address. Combattalkradio.net will still work, but combattalk.fm going forward is our new website address. Check out all of our latest episodes. We're going to go ahead and dig into our weekend of boxing. Mostly this is DAZN. The vast majority is DAZN. And some of these may not be of interest, but I'm going to talk about them anyway. And I do think at least two of them are worth your time. At the head, right up front, at the footprint center out in Phoenix in the U.S., 12 rounds of super middleweight action. Jaime Munguia, or they say Munguia, and it is officially Munguia, but I say Munguia because of pronunciation, my personal pronunciation, simple. Fights John Ryder. People feel like this is a good fight for Munguia. I find that funny because people trashed John Ryder when he was about to be fighting Canelo Alvarez, but for whatever reason, there's a different standard when it's Canelo in there, and they... If, if you're going against Canelo, you're a bum, but if you're going against Munguia, you're quality. You know, I don't understand why that's coming across because the bottom line is John Ryder was never a bum. John Ryder is, he's skilled and somebody who can beat him is skilled in, in concert. So he was never a bum. His record makes him seem like he's a bum, but he tests guys and it takes somebody quality to be able to beat him. So it's a good test for Munguia, just like it was a good test for Canelo because he could very well have done something with Canelo and Canelo was not able to really deal with Ryder with significant ease. So let's not rewrite history here. John Ryder was always going to be a good test no matter who he fights against. So this is a good fight as a good test for Munguia as it was a good test for Canelo. Let's be consistent. And I'm a fan of both. I'm less a fan of Munguia only because it feels like he's being, he's being promoted in a way, and it's not his fault, but he's being promoted in a way to position him for a fight against Canelo, which is the current chatter going around, is that that would be the next fight if he gets past John Ryder because Canelo has been pushed to fight David Benavidez, who's coming off a really good win on Demetrius Andre. But I didn't really rate Demetrius Andre outside of skill. Demetrius Andre is skilled, but in terms of levels, I didn't really rate Demetrius Andre. Now, Canelo fighting Mungui, I have no problem with that specific fight as a step to David Benavidez, but I would prefer him fight David Benavidez now since Munguia's got his hands full of Ryder, Canelo has not announced his next fight. The one I don't want to see is a Vival rematch, and I don't know why NSB and other places are screaming for a Vival rematch because Canelo should have never taken that fight in the first place. It, he has no business up there. You can talk about the Kovalev all you care to. It's a stupid fight to have. Canelo should stay in his lane at 168 and deal with the threats that are there, just like Crawford at 147. Deal with the threats in your own weight class. Let's stop these circus mismatches. You know, there's chatter about Crawford fighting Tia Fimo because Tia Fimo called him out and Crawford fighting Tank because Crawford called him out and Shakur calling out Tank. We got to stop these circus mismatches. Stay in your lane, deal with who's in your weight class, deal with that first. Then we can talk about if you're purposely moving up in weight, then we deal with it. Right now, there are threats available for Canelo. There are threats available for Munguia. There are threats available for Benavides. There are threats available that you can be fighting. Let's fight them. Let's really, quote, clean up your side of the street before we start jumping weight classes. And that's how I feel about Jaime Munguia. He's got work to do in his current weight class at super middleweight. And this is a good step towards whatever it is going to be. And if it happens to be Canelo, we need to not be trashing on that fight because it would be a good fight for however the hell long it lasts. Now, most online speculate that Munguia deals with John Ryder with ease. I don't know where the hell that's coming from because Munguia has looked vulnerable in almost every step up fight he's had. Do I think Ryder beats him? No. Do I think that Ryder exposes some flaws? Absolutely. I think that John Ryder is going to be there all night long. I think Mungui is going to have to work. I think Mungui is going to come in slower initially and look a little bit vulnerable off of something Ryder does. And then Mungui will, you know, he'll snap in and then all of a sudden he'll start, he'll turn it up and get Ryder out of there. Some in the championship rounds, you know, after round eight, say, then I think Munguia will step it up and get out because that's how it seems like his pattern is he's he'll end up in trouble. He'll end up hurt early on, does Munguia off of whether he loses focus, whatever. And then he steps it up, he gets snapped in and gets him out of there. I think the same thing will happen here. I think it's a good fight to watch because it's a good level set for where Munguia happens to be as a fighter. And I'm 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 eager to see personally my zone. I canceled it, but I think I still have access to the end of the month. So I might check that one out. Depends on what time it starts. Same uh, same event, uh, 12 rounds at minimum weight. So these are small guys. And so some people aren't going to watch this. I think it's a good fight. 
Oscar Colazzo fighting Rodriguez Gutierrez. Again, I think it's a great fight. Uh, Oscar Colazzo, he's been on a tear undefeated, young, but he's been on a tear so far. Gutierrez has the one loss. Um, he was uh, that was a decision loss. It wasn't a dominant. I didn't I didn't see it as a dominant, but. I don't see that Colazzo is going to have any trouble with Gutierrez. As good as Gutierrez is, I think Colazzo is going to just wash him. I believe it's going to be a stoppage sometime in the mid-rounds is my guess. I think it's a, I think it's a 12-rounder. Uh, is that a 12-round fight? Yes, 12-rounder. So I, I figured somewhere in the middle rounds he's going to be um, dominant to take him out is my guess. The other big fight, so I, I consider this a top fight. The media has been suppressing this one. I don't know why the fuck. Uh, anyway, 12 rounds of flyweight women's action. Uh, Gabriella Fundora makes her return fighting Christina Cruz. Now, the reason that I say this is one of the top, two top fights is Gabriella Fundora is highly skilled, but Christina Cruz is also highly skilled. They're both undefeated. And Christina Cruz has every disadvantage in this fight. She's shorter. She doesn't have the reach. Fundora is a southpaw. Fundora is busy. She She's active. She comes and she throws and she does what she needs to do to get women out of there and she has a higher than normal knockout ratio christina cruz has no knockouts in any of her wins she's a decision fighter but we just saw mio yoshida completely dominate on box completely dominate ebony bridges and take ebony bridges belt so there is a chance although slim there is a chance that cruz could upset the card i don't personally see it i'm calling it out statistically speaking People are looking at the knockout ratio and saying that Cruz doesn't have a chance. It's not the knockouts. That's not a reason to say somebody doesn't win. The reason Cruz would not have a strong chance is because Gabriella has every damn advantage in this fight. She has the height advantage. She has the reach advantage. She has the rounds of experience advantage, and she's a southpaw, and she's got the age. Everything leans numerically towards Gabriella which means that if Cruz can somehow figure it out, it's a huge upset, which makes it a top fight by definition. Cruz is 40 plus years old, okay? So I'm not saying at any point that she is going to blitz or da, da, da. I'm saying she, if she can do it, it's a huge win against a top level opponent. Gabriela Fundora is a top level opponent in the flyweight women's division. So I think it's worth watching because it's one of the that curiosity factor. Like Yoshida, nobody gave Yoshida a chance against Ebony Bridges. Nobody gave her a chance, and then she pulls up the amazing upset, a dominant unanimous. Something like that could happen. I just don't see it. You know, she would have to just beat the body and do the impossible to pull this off, and I, I don't see it. And you're wondering about the age. Cruz only has six fights to her name. She debuted in 2021. Fundora debuted in 2021. They debuted at the same time. Cruz hasn't had anywhere near the number of rounds as Fundora did, even though they debuted at the same time, right? Fundora's southpaw. Fundora's taller. Fundora's rangier. Fundora has been at the top. She's been in there with quality women's opposition. So every advantage, it, it's, again, toppling that top guy in your division. It's that underdog story that could. I just don't see it. I can't call it a mismatch because Cruz has skill that stems all the way back. At the, I'm pretty sure it was the Olympics that we first saw it. She has skill, so I can't necessarily call it a mismatch in that regard. I am, and Fundora, it's kind of unfair because Fundora just has physical advantages no matter who she's in there with. But Cruz's skill might help in trying to upset the cart if she can figure that out, just like we saw with Sebastian Fundora where he got upset against a complete underdog. So... It's something to watch. That's all I'm calling. I think it's worth watching. And you're either going to see Fundora completely dominate this woman or you're going to see Cruz shock the world and beat Gabriella Fundora. I don't know what's going to happen. My heart leans towards Gabriella, but I'm looking at the numbers saying there's a chance there's an upset on that one. Now we're going to switch to Belfast in the UK, the new Ford Sports Complex, 10 rounds at welterweight action. Lewis Crocker, not Joe Crocker, Lewis Crocker fighting Jose Felix Jr. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what you would define as a mismatch. Blatant mismatch from my eyes, anyway. And I'll tell you why. Crocker's undefeated. He's been on a tear. Dominant. He's, he's a boxer, pure boxer, the dominant. He debuted about, you know, seven years ago, something like that. Doesn't have a lot of rounds in the books. He's been matched very selectively, carefully. 
Felix Jr. has been in the business a long time. He debuted, I think, 2009, way back yon. So he has way more rounds of experience. But prior to his most recent fight, his recent fight, he got a stoppage, but that was a soft touch stoppage to rebuild. Prior to that, he got a dominant losses three times, dominant. So I wasn't sure where his head was at. Now he's got power, okay? So it's not like he's a slouch. The reason I call it a mismatch is because if you look at styles of the two, Crocker's guy, I think, going to box circles around this guy. I hope not because I, I do think Felix is a warrior and he's got the power, but I think Crocker's going to box circles around this guy and make it look easy. That's what my gut tells me is going to happen because it's the only thing I can see as an outcome. I don't see Crocker getting a knockout. I see it just a complete master class of boxing to get him out of there. That's what I see. There was a little bit of chaos around this fight because the initial theory was that First of all, Felix, uh, there was a theory that Felix might not make weight for the fight. So that was another reason I was like, okay, is he done? Is he toast? What's going on there? He did make weight for the fight, so it's on. And again, the, the weight shift and the weight question and uncertainty there is another reason I feel like it's a mismatch because Crocker had no problems going in and doing what he needed to do. That's welterweight action, so we get to see, at least on the you know regional side, what the next class of welterweights is looking like. So check that one out. If you so choose, it's still on the zone. Same arena, 10 rounds at cruiserweight action. Siobhan Clark fighting Tommy McCarthy. I talked about Siobhan Clark in his most recent fight. He got a dominant decision on that one. This is a decently matched fight. I wouldn't call it a great match fight. It's a decently matched fight. McCarthy has been on a steep decline. He got knocked out in his most recent fight. He has more experience, but he's been on a decline. So I'm clearly going to lean towards Clark. Clark's undefeated. Clark is dominant. Clark has been kind of carefully matched, but I don't see that McCarthy's going to have anything for Clark from my eyes in this one. If McCarthy's going to do anything to get this guy out of there, it's going to be catching Siobhan with something he doesn't see in a stun. Like it would be like a stun moment where you stun him with a shot and then you go after him. That's the only chance McCarthy's got, and I don't see that McCarthy has the skill to pull that off. Maybe he does, but I don't personally see it, especially where his head's at, and we don't know where his head's at. Fresh off what happened before. So I'm leaning towards Siobhan in that one too. Just to complete outbox the guy. Same arena, 10 rounds at welterweight action. Patty Donovan fighting William Andres Herrera. Great fight, Patty Donovan. A big fan of his. Loved his last performance. Amazing guy. South Paul, young, uh, rangy. He's just, he's just quality for his level where he's at. Works to get you out of there. I really like the dude. Herrera. I like Herrera. I just, he's, I don't want to say decline. That's not the fair statement. He has the two losses that happened, and one of them seemed to really mess with him. And I don't know what it was. I don't see that Donovan's going to have very much trouble. I think Herrera's going to be there for the early part. I think Donovan's eventually going to get him out of there. I think it's a stoppage, possibly sometime after the fifth round ish. I think Donovan's going to get a forced ref stoppage, is my call on that one. Now we're going to switch to Plant City, the White Sands Event Center. 10 rounds at featherweight action, Angelo Leo fighting Mike Planilla. A decently good fight. I wouldn't say a great fight, but a decently good fight. Uh, I had not heard of, I had not heard, I'd heard of Mike Planilla, but not in the context of this kind of a fight. What I mean by this is, this is on ProBox, by the way, so you can check this out. ProBox, for whatever reason, as a shout out. Some of their, you can sign up for free, and the vast majority of their fights are available for free. You do have to stream it online. It's not on cable. But I would do I do recommend checking this out because it doesn't cost you anything to do so to sign up for it. Just, you do have to create an account. Once you create an account, you're in there. The event will start. You click it and it starts. I didn't have very many problems trying to get the stream. But the reason I say I didn't get to see much on Plania, he has not been featured enough because he's from the Philippines, I believe. He's not been featured enough for me to get a real pulse on how bad or good he may be. I know he got knocked out the last time, but it seemed like it seemed like it was a silly mistake. It didn't seem like it was a decline or any of that. It just seemed like a stupid mistake. If Let's grant that may be the case. If it was a stupid mistake, then he has a chance to upset Leo if he can stay focused. I'm not sure he can stay focused. That's the concern. And so this was an intriguing fight. I don't know. This is on Wednesday, by the way. So if you do check out Pro Box, just sign up to Pro Box. They have a feature that alerts you when the fight's about to start, and you can check this one out. This one's going to be one, I think, worth watching. 
If you're one of those that hates the little guys, then it is what it is. But I think it's going to be worth uh, the time. Also on Pro Box, 10 rounds at lightweight action. Romero Duno, who at one point, the DAZN announcers were calling a young Manny Pacquiao, and then he got absolutely knocked the heck out, <laughs> versus Antonio Moran. So Duno's been out for a while. He got knocked out in the first. That was the one I was talking about where they were calling him a young Manny Pacquiao, and then he got stopped most recently in four. And Moran, he's got, he got dominated twice. So they're both on a rebuild. They're about the same age. They're about the same. Statistically, it's a good matched fight as a rebuild for both guys and seeing where they both go. My gut tells me that Duno is going to get beat again. I think Moran is going to be just enough. Not He's not overkill. He's not, you know, but I think he's going to be just enough to deal with Duno. Duno, he makes too many mistakes. That's, that's the only problem with the guy. He makes too many mistakes. He gets caught, and that's what happened both times, is he gets caught. So when they were calling him a young Manny Pacquiao, it's just because he's, you know, he's popping around, he's doing the fast hands and all that, but he has the same flaws as a young Manny Pacquiao in the sense he gets clipped and gets taken out. It's not like he's a glass jaw, but if you're mid-move and you get clipped, you're going to get taken out, and I think that's likely to happen. I'm not guaranteeing it because I really don't know where Moran's head is after dominant losses, but he didn't get knocked out. So I'm hoping that his head is in a stronger place than Duno in the sense that Duno got knocked out and stopped in his last two, whereas Moran just got outboxed. He didn't get knocked out in his recent two. So it seemed like, okay, I just got decision. This guy's not going to go for a decision. Duno doesn't go for a decision. He tries to get you out of there. So maybe he can capitalize on a mistake and deal with Duno. Again, that's pro box. I think that one, that was definitely worth checking out on Wednesday. On Friday, we're switching to the Orlando, the Carib Royale. Ten rounds at lightweight action. Ashton Sill versus Esteban Falcao. A great fight for what it is. It's slightly mismatched. I'll get to that in a second. But I think it's a great fight for what it is. Silva is the one that's being heavily pushed and heavily promoted. Knockout. Beast. Power. Both hands. He debuted like four years ago-ish. Uh, he's solid. Don't get me twisted. I think, though, it's you know how he's been matched. Falcao is going to have an opportunity to test this guy. Falcao's a quality boxer. So although Falcao has losses, he's a quality boxer. And if Sills not careful, he can get clipped on something. I'm not saying that definitely happens. I'm not guaranteeing anything. I truly don't know. I'm saying if anybody could do it, Falcao is one of those who actually could pull something off and upset the card on Silv. Silv... He needs to focus on getting Falcao out of there early. That's That should be his focus. You got to get this guy out of there early. If you don't get him out of there early, it's going to be a long night for you, young man. And so let's see how that one goes. We're going to switch now. This is also Friday now. Houston, the Red Owl Boxing Arena, eight rounds at welterweight action. Uh, Quashan Toler versus Vlad Panin. Don't know either guy. I ran the numbers, and what I saw was an intriguing match. You have two boxers. But Tolaire, he's one, he'll he'll look for an opportunity to get you out of there. That was good. Both have one loss, so it's it's pretty evenly matched on the numbers. It's one match each. Same number of, of wins. I was I was impressed with the matchup on this one. And so I, I figured this one's worth watching, if only it tells us where welterweight's gonna potentially go, because whoever wins this one has an opportunity up next. I do think. In my from my lens, as I watch the two, I'm leaning a little bit more towards Panin. Not a lot, because it's possible that Tolaire just simply gets you out of there if Panin makes that mistake. That's what I got on deck. I want to talk about a couple of different things happening in the realm of boxing. So, number one, we still don't have any announcement from the welterweight, currently unified, not undisputed champion, Terrence Bud Crawford. Uh, he had said that the fight with the rematch with Errol Spence was supposed to happen in January. That did not happen. We have not seen another announcement coming out of Terrence Crawford's camp other than Big Mac saying that there was no reason to fight Boots and he brings nothing to the table. So we don't really have a fight, and Crawford is inactive for an extended period of time. I want to warn people, especially people on NSB who aren't paying attention, that when you have fighters who are inactive for a period of time, they tend to take an L when they actually do get back to heck in the ring. So... What you should be asking for is for fighters to stay active. Now, Crawford had been averaging one fight a year, but you would expect that he would have taken at least some sort of a soft fight just to keep it active until whatever fight would happen. And that fight could have been boots, and he chose not to do it. He chose not to go get your belt back. So now we don't have 
any sort of resolution at welterweight. What we do have, though, that was announced. Initially, Keith, once upon a time, Thurman was going to fight Stankonia. That's not going to happen. I don't know why. Keith, once upon a time, Thurman, apparently, and apparently this is a sign, is going to go up to 154. He's going to fight Tim Zhu. People think that Tim Zhu is going to absolutely blow Keith once upon, once upon a time out. Maybe he does because Keith has been significantly inactive, as always, and maybe that's the retirement shot and Tim Zhu moves on. But it was intriguing to see that the Stankonia fight would not happen because Stankonia has also been inactive for a length of time. Cody Crowley's been inactive for a length of time. We got a stale 147, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to put it straight. Blair the Flair Cops has been available. That fight's not happening. You've got Mario Barros. He's still out there kind of floating. I believe he has a fight booked. You've got a couple of guys, but 147 is now dead. It's officially dead, and we're not getting back any sort of steam because most of the fighters stepped aside to allow Spence and Crawford to do their thing, and then they stayed aside waiting on the rematch, which did not happen. So Terrence Crawford's holding up 147. That's what's happening. The fight that could have been easy to make was Crawford versus Boots. That's not happening. Crawford's ducking Boots, and so now we don't know what's going on 147. The now hot spot of all boxing divisions is arguably 135 and 140, more so 140. So we're going to be seeing where we go from here. But if you're a fan, you should be really critical of Terrence Crawford because of the fact that he could have fought Boots and chose not to and held up the division this long for a rematch that looks like it's not really going to happen, certainly not at 147, because let's say it does happen at 154. That means Crawford could have fought Boots at 147 because Spence damn sure is not making 147. If Crawford was going to go to 154 and fight whoever up there, that means he could have vacated 147 instead of allowing Boots to straight up take the belt from him after getting stripped. We know what the game is. That's all I got for you guys. I'll check in after the fights.